Welcome to part two of our special Rare Cancer episode. The conversation continues with our panel of guests. I'll hand you back over to Nick and Mary Angels. Nick, sh- sh- shall we continue a little bit more? Yeah, I wanted to, I'm just thinking about the situation that we're in now in terms of COVID and obviously how that's impacted you. I know, I think Shaquille, you have mentioned that you had quite an interesting, in terms of isolating and, and, and what COVID has meant for your lifestyle changing again a little bit. Yeah, so originally when uh, it, it brought back memories back for me being like trying to lock up back in the house. So after I had my operation, there was like uh, nine months or 12 months where uh, before I had uh, the reversal surgery uh, where I had to deal with my storm and the operation where I was actually, you know, couldn't travel anywhere, couldn't move anywhere. Uh, the operation had left me with some nerve damage and stuff in my leg. I couldn't move. So I was in the house a lot. Uh, which it does impact your mental health and uh, it sort of brought back memories of that and uh, how I got out of that situation was um, I was I wasn't able to work full-time but what I would do was I'd volunteer at the local primary school uh, as a TA so I'll take uh, like an afternoon or a morning um, maybe twice a week just to get out of the house go talk to somebody um, some other people meet new people you know read a book with a child, you know, anything just to get your mind off what your normal thinking process is. You're always looking at what uh, had been and what was going to come forward. And it does affect your mental health quite um, strongly. It gives you uh, thoughts that, you know, you you didn't think you would ever have. Um, so when it came to this COVID thing and, the, you know, they start saying the same thing to you again, uh, like you need to stay inside of the house, uh, so I turn to other things, um, you know, I, I do a bit of caring, uh, I do an hour here, an hour there, uh, and I also help out at a food bank, so I do like a, uh, like today I was supposed to be doing a, a, in the morning, I do like a, a few deliveries, it's just to get out of the house, it's just to not be in a situation where um, you feel as if you're like a bit claustrophobic and you, you're left with just your own thoughts, mm-hmm. Um so for me, it's just you've got to keep yourself active. You've got to keep yourself um, thinking positive. And if you're helping somebody else, you always end up feeling better about yourself if you're doing something to help somebody else. So a bit of uh, volunteering here and there, it's, it was a good thing because nobody expects anything from you um, when you're volunteering. Like mm-hmm. if you, you do what you're able to do. So if it meant you're going into a school and you're just reading a book with a child, you know, in whatever year, one, two, three, it doesn't really mean that you put in a lot of effort in there. You just sat there and listened to some child read a book. But that, on your mental aspect of the fact that you're out of the house now, that you're able to leave the house for an hour and then you come back home, that bit is like a bit of a, uh, a triumph for yourself because you're able to leave the house. Um, after, Especially if, like for me, I was in bed for like uh, four months uh, after my surgery with the uh, having to deal with all the... Um, settling down and everything of how, how it went through and dealing with a storm again, which was out of the blue um, and learning all these new aspects about my body. Um, so when so, COVID yeah. came, Shaquille, Pardon? when COVID happened, well, obviously we're still in it now, but in terms yeah. of, did you have to isolate? Was there any particular? Yeah. So I, I, I was, I've already had my uh, COVID jab as well. Cause I was, uh, cause I, after I've had my, um, problem with my uh, bowel cancer, uh, the, uh, the medication, everything I was on uh, made it, uh, I, I've actually been diagnosed with sarcoidosis now as well. So I'm on uh, immunosuppressant steroids and things. So they put me down as clinically vulnerable. So they put, I had to, have my, uh, I had to stay home shield uh, and things like that. So just to be able to just to pop out a little while, an hour here, now there, a bit of exercise, I had that in my more hand that I'm not going to be uh, sat at home and just sit inside again because of what I went through the first time. Um, uh, and so I've just been a little bit proactive just to keep myself busy a little bit. I can't go back to work, do 70 hours a week, but I can do little bits here and there just to keep myself a little bit uh, active. Uh, keep my, um, you know, the bubble, you know, your, your social bubble quite small. Uh, I only visit the same people. I don't have multiple clients who I go to care for. I only visit two or three people, that's it. But just to go and see them, talk to them, uh, you know, they're stuck at home at the moment themselves. Myself, it's like a, a little bit of a, a, you know, positive for me and them. 
um, just you. to give something back to some the community that you live in as well. Thank you very much. I think it's really nice to hear that that you are doing a little bit of what it is possible to do. So you, you just taking that at a time. Thank you very much. I don't know, Nick, would you like to continue maybe asking something else to Gareth? Yes. Hello, Gareth, again. Hi. <laughs> um, you've been listening to everyone. I'm sure it's been really interesting to hear their journeys. Um, Absolutely. We, we're obviously here talking about rare cancers. Um, and we, we touched on this um, before this conversation started, actually. But I'd love to, to ask you more about it in terms of we also wanted to know how rare inherited cancers can also give rise to common cancers and whether you could tell us a little bit more about this connection so that um, we always say we're not as rare as we think we are. We always say that during this whole series. Um, so it'd be really interesting to, for you to explain to us in terms of cancer, what that means and how rare cancer can still be connected to common cancers. So, well, what we know is that, that obviously cancer itself is common, that actually about one in two of us will get cancer in our lifetime now. Uh, or, or are predicted to get cancer in our lifetime. So it's not rare at all. And cancers like breast cancer affect one in eight to 10 women, so hardly rare. Um, bowel cancer affects about one in 18 to 20 people, so slightly more common in men than women. So really not rare at all. Uh, but one of the things that sort of differentiates is the age of onset. So uh, uh, I think both Shaquille and Freddie talked about how young their relatives were and they were uh, at diagnosis. And in bowel cancer, I mean, over 90 percent of bowel cancers occur over 50 years of age. Mm -hmm. So so bowel cancer at younger ages is much less common. And uh and breast cancer, 80% of all breast cancers occur over the age of 50. So again, younger onset is, is linked. In terms of the genes, I mean, actually, Shaquille's gene is the most important gene in causing bowel cancer. Over 60% of bowel cancers have an APC mutation. And uh, Shaquille has an inherited APC mutation, but that actually only causes about one in thousand bowel cancers. But uh, the, the gene itself is absolutely pivotal in the development of the majority of bowel cancers. But nearly all of those genetic mutations occur as acquired events. So as cells in the bowel, the developed bowel are dividing, you get a mutation in the APC gene. And that is the first step in the process to cancer. And cancer is a multi-step process that, that you probably require at least five important genetic mutations to get a cancer. In the case of APC and Lynch and BRCA, not only do you have to lose or have a mutation in one copy, but the other copy needs to go missing as well. So it's what's called a two-hit hypothesis. And in fact, retinoblastoma, which was a real rare cancer, um, uh, the Al Knudsen in 1971 actually developed this two-hit hypothesis so that it's dominant at the level of the family, but recessive at the level of the cancer. So you need to lose that second copy to, de uh, to, to drive the cancer. So although both Lynch syndrome and uh, uh, the Lynch syndrome genes, there are four mismatch repair genes. I'm, I'm sure probably Freddie has MSH2, which is the one that commonly causes the Mutore syndrome, where you get skin cancers as well as, uh, as bowel cancer. About 3% of bowel cancer is caused by inherited Lynch syndrome mutation. So much more common than, than polyposis. Um, but actually, a further... Uh, about 12% of bowel cancer is caused by having genetic faults that are acquired in the mismatch repair gene. So, so, so that's still very important in the causation, but usually those are older onset uh, people uh, uh, later in life. Actually, BRCA1 and 2 actually fairly rarely uh, are the, the cause in an acquired sense, they're nearly all always inherited for breast cancer, although 
For ovarian cancer, about 15% of ovarian cancer is due to BRCA inherited mutations. About 5% is due to acquired genetic mutations in the BRCA genes. So, uh, so uh, that's a sort of a, a sort of potted thing that these are cancers are common, but the inherited causes are much less common as a cause. As I said, BRCA only two percent of all breast cancers, but a lot more of ovarian cancer. Lynch syndrome only three percent of uh, of bowel cancer, three percent of womb inherit uh, of womb cancers, and what we call endometrial cancer. That's cancer of the lining of the womb, which is actually for women probably at least as common, if not slightly more common than bowel cancer, as the the cancer that tends to occur. Thank you. Before we ask you a little bit about the future, because we have these ready, but I would like to know if Freddie, Fern, Shaquille or Amy, when you hear Gareth talking, is there any particular thing that um, you would like to ask him or respond to him in, rela in relation to what he's saying, uh, the connection between common cancers and mm, more genetic ones? Any, is there anything you want to ask him or say? I find that uh, a lot of that stuff uh, that uh, Gareth's been talking about, uh, my geneticist team and the consultants have been very, very thorough mm. in explaining to us uh, over the last, well, uh, been like nearly three or four years for me now. Um, any questions I've always had, they've always been honest and straightforward. Mm. They never like thought, thought that, oh, we don't want to hurt your feelings. Kind of. It's always been like, this is what it's like and this is what's going to happen. This is the possibilities so they've always they never like um, made it out as if it's going to be any better than it is going to be. Uh, they've always said it as it is. And that's been quite uh, eye opening. And I actually liked it that way because you get you're easier to prepare for what's going to happen. You're not uh, in any uh, falsehoods. It takes a bit of time. Like I said, I was in a bit of denial at the beginning. But uh, no, they've been very, very thorough. I've uh, I can't say anything bad about the team that looked after me uh, in any any stage, actually, um, throughout also, my treatment. Sorry, Shakir. I was going to ask, because I think you picked up on a really interesting point. How important is it in terms of that communication? So, Fern, I'm thinking about, obviously, you were given some really, as well, you know, big life-changing kind of decisions to make. And mm. how important or how impactful was the way that it was communicated to you by... Yeah, by I think, I think it, the clarity... Um, I think it's, it's a bit of a problem. I think it depends on personality and how you cope with information. Um, but I think, you know, no one sort of takes the, the news initially when you kind of find it all out and think, you know, happy days, yay, yeah. really pleased about that. Um, you know, it, it's obviously a process, but I think for me, and a little bit like what Gareth explained about that patient that he remembered sort of years ago with the children, that actually being very thankful that you know that you've got, this mutation because you've had it since birth there's nothing you can do about it there's no way that you could have prevented having this mutation and for me finding out about it so young particularly because there was young breast cancers in the 20s in my family was actually really powerful and was it enabled me to take that control so having information presented to you in a very kind but clear way um helps you it's like a no-brainer you know I wouldn't have chosen to have had the surgery I've had um because you know it's it was it wasn't it's not something that you would want to do but it was certainly a decision I wanted to make because it was a no-brainer for me I had this opportunity to reduce my risk significantly um, and the clarity of the information and the way it's given to me enabled me to make that decision quite easily it's the, the kind of mental health side of it is getting to grips with what you're going to got to go through and you know how you're going to feel and look and, and everything afterwards and is that kind of implication certainly for the gene fault that I carry but in terms of reducing my risk it, it really was a no-brainer for me and um, so so yeah I think that clarity of information it is very clear and it's and it is sort of like quite hard hitting but it's also delivered in a very kind way and I've had immense support from the team at Manchester from the genetics consultant through to the psychologist 
which is a mandatory thing that you have that you have to do if you're going through the surgery I went through um, and the way that they work together I've had everything done at Manchester even though I'm based over in Lancashire I've had all my surgeries at, at Manchester because I've got that trust in their communication with each other and just the care that they'll give me um, so I kind of made that conscious decision to have everything done there. And does it I went through some genetic counselling when I was starting a family for different reasons, but um, I became quite close to my genetic counsellor um, and we formed quite a relationship. And then obviously once I'd had my children, we do still keep in touch, um, but not as regularly, much to my disappointment. So, and I just wondered what happens, I don't know where you are at this stage, but when you've you know, finished with, and, and you can kind of go back to life even for a year or two, do you feel like you get this, you know, what's the, the support like in terms of on par with what you receive when you're going through your treatment how does that work yeah so for, for me there isn't um there isn't like a need for me to I'm not going through consultations I'm not going through gene testing I'm not going through all that preparation so there isn't a need for regular appointments but um you know the I've rung them with just questions like you know when I was pregnant I wasn't able to have my screening um and then you start, you know, I'm pregnant and suddenly I'm not able to have the screening. I should have had that year. And suddenly the brain starts ticking away thinking, well, now I'm at more at risk because of all the hormones associated with pregnancy. And I've, I've always been able to call the, you know, genetics team and just say, can you give me a ring back? And they'll talk it through to me and they'll reassure me, honestly, you know, whether I need to be concerned. And if there is any concern, what I need to do about it. Um, you know, so whilst I don't have it like a regular sort of contact with them I've always been able to get in touch with them and as far as I'm aware we'll always have that option because even though I've reduced my risk um with the options that I've got and um, I've still I'm still a gene carrier and there'll still be things yes. that and, and as thing as things develop as well as the understanding and the treatments and things develop so I think I'll always be able to have that contact and you know we'll be able to ask for an appointment as well if there's something I want to talk through so yeah like it's it's immense support really and I'm very thankful for it and I think you've touched on something which I think I'm just going to go back to Gareth and I know Shaquille and um also mentioned it in terms of future and of you will always have an interest because of the hereditary nature of your cancer and what happens next in terms of future generations or future plans yeah, well, I'm interested to know a little bit more of when you hear Fern talking, Gareth, um, whether that is making you think about the future and the future of research and the future of, of talking about research and uh, to families. Is there anything that is in offer now or that you see happening? Well, I mean, one of the things that we do talk about, because we do talk about the possibility of tests during pregnancy and even pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So testing, you have IVF and you, the embryo is created outside the womb and you then test that and only implant embryos that don't have the genetic fault. But actually very few people with, with BRCA or, um, or Lynch syndrome opt down those routes. They, they, they will usually go ahead and have children I mean, one of the reasons is, is that these cancers are preventable, that you can target the, the cancers. They can be prevented by, by surgery. Uh, and uh, there are now more things in the, the armamentarium. So we know for Lynch, Lynch syndrome that aspirin is very effective. That even if you get an advanced cancer now for Lynch syndrome, you have targeted checkpoint inhibitors because these are very immune uh, cancers that occur in Lynch syndrome. So there are therapies that give you a better chance of cure. You're already at a better chance of cure in Lynch syndrome because the cancers are so immune and your immune system fights them. Um, for breast cancer, we now have PARP inhibitor drugs. And these are drugs that specifically target um, the cancers. Uh, essentially, the cancers have lost one, the main method of repairing DNA. And if you then target the cancer and don't give the alternative routes, you block the alternative route to repairing DNA, the cancers can't repair themselves. So they basically, it's like what we call synthetic lethal. It's like giving them a suicide pill. Mm. So that kills off the cancer. And we hope that eventually PARP inhibitors may be used for prevention. Mm. Okay. 
So we 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 currently have a, a prevention trial for BRCA1 with a drug called donosumab, which is a has very very few side effects. It's used in osteoporosis treatment. It's a rank ligand inhibitor, and we're just starting a trial for BRCA1. But unfortunately, the evidence doesn't suggest it'll work as well in BRCA2. But BRCA2, you, you have drugs like aromatase inhibitors after the menopause, tamoxifen before the menopause, which will cut the risk of cancer by 40 to 50 percent. And so certainly some women choose to go down that route. So the future is bright. And when you're talking about having a child that's not at risk for another 25 to 30 years, how much... Um, progress there will be in being able to prevent these cancers short of having surgery but even then there's still surgery means that actually very few uh, families decide they're going to have testing in pregnancy or go down the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis route we do see it quite a bit more in families with von Hippel and with uh, with neurofibromatosis type 2 and to some extent in APC as well, that, that people, because, you know, you've heard Shaquille's story, that's pretty hard to live with mm -hmm. having going through all he's been through, you, you, you know, so, so you do come across more people in what we call these syndromic cancer cancers, where you can make a diagnosis in one individual. So for, for instance, in Shaquille, as soon as he's got a hundred polyps you don't need a family history to make a diagnosis that's inherited if you've got a hundred polyps in uh, in amy's family situation once you find uh, someone who's got the the hemangioblastoma which is the benign tumor of the back of the brain or the angiomas in the eyes once you've got a couple of those features in a single individual it's von hippel lindau disease you don't need a family history, you don't need a gene test to, to make that diagnosis. But obviously, we are hopeful that there are going to be better preventive measures, preventive treatments for von Hippel, for, for APC in the future. For instance, in NF2, which is probably my, I did my thesis on neurofibromatosis type 2, where you get tumors on the nerves particularly affecting the ears so you lose both hearing uh you lose both uh the hearing on both sides you get meningiomas tumors on the lining of the brain a bit like hemangioblastomas they're benign tumors but because of where they are they can cause problems um and uh in that condition we now have a drug which has made a massive difference called avastin a bevacizumab we actually thought it would be a better drug in von hippel but it turned out not to work particularly well because von hippel tumors are caused by uh activation of sort of vegf pathway and these are vegf inhibitors but they actually work better in nf2 than they work in uh, in von hippel and that's made a massive difference to life expectancy and to um, the ability to save hearing, which makes a massive difference to quality of life. So we have made enormous progress in the inherited cancer syndromes in the last 10 years in terms of the types of treatment available if you get the tumor and even in potentially being able to prevent the tumors happening in the first place. Really interesting thinking about how the NHS might look different as well in the future in the way that we are given treatment or have access to treatment or tests. Nick, um, Gary said before, I remember you said uh, very smart GP when you met, somebody was mentioned, went to the GP and you said, Gareth, it was a very smart GP. So yeah. I'm just, just wondering how this would look like in the, in the near future. Um, because everybody's talking about going, being arriving to the genetic department of Manchester as the big thing. But is there any other plans for the future to integrate genetics in a different way or a more? Well, I think that's already happening in terms of uh, testing for, for BRCA in particular, for mm -hmm. BRCA1 and 2, that we have what's called mainstreaming now. So everyone used to have to go to genetics to be tested for BRCA1 and 2. Now, the oncologist or the surgeon can order the BRCA test on someone with ovarian cancer or someone with breast cancer now. 
uh, you do not need to be referred. Now, ideally, anyone who has a family history should still be referred. Um, and obviously, if they are found to have a genetic, te uh, genetic fault, they will be referred. But genetics is no longer so much the gatekeeper of who gets tested that, that it, this is being opened out. Now, um, whether that gets opened out further is, is another matter. But there are strong lines of thought and uh, uh, many people writing that we should be doing population testing for BRCA or and Lynch syndrome because these are cancers we can make a big difference to and half of the people with the genetic faults don't really have any sort of a family history that tells you that it's there. So without doing the gene test you'll only find out when someone in that family gets cancer, which might be at a, a later stage than you can do anything about. Now, that's a huge step to do population testing. And the, the question will then be, when do you do it? At what age? You know, under what circumstances? What sort of pre-test counselling? Because it can be a massive shock mm. to someone with no family history, no preparation at all, to suddenly be told you've actually got a high risk of cancer. Although the, the one slightly reassuring thing is if there is no family history of cancer, it usually means the risk is lower because other people who carry that genetic fault have gotten away with it. And that may be because they carry other genetic factors that protect them. And those genetic factors may also be inherited by um, the, child, the, the, the person at risk of inheriting that, that genetic fault who carries it. So these uh, polygenic risk scores that we can now develop for all the common cancers for bowel, uh, womb, ovary, prostate, breast, ovary, we can now test these alongside testing for the genetic fault in known families. And we're starting a research project where we're offering the polygenic risk scores for BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers so that we can better define the risk in the range for someone with a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. For instance, for a woman, the risk isn't up to 85%. It's a risk in a range of 35 to 95%. And we can much better define what the risk is in that range to drive decision making such as, you know, do I decide to have preventive mastectomy. Well, it's an easier decision if you know your risk is 95% than if your risk is 35%. Mm. And also for ovarian cancer, for a BRCA2 carrier, could you delay surgery on the ovaries until after 50, for instance? Unfortunately, ovarian screening is not effective. So we, we tend to, to directively counsel uh, 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 people towards to having the ovaries removed. For BRCA2, that needs to be done probably in the early 40s. But if we could delay it until they've gone through the natural menopause, that might be more satisfactory for many women. Uh, and these polygenic risk scores may well be able to say, look, the risk is, is that much less. And for families like Shaquille, maybe it will explain why someone gets 500 polyps and someone else in that family only gets a few because there are other modifying genetic factors you inherit which determine how badly you or what risk you are of of these things. And in the next, you even in the next two or three years, these things are going to be coming into common practice to do these additional genetic tests in addition to the, in, the most important one in that family, which is do you have APC or VHL or BRCA1 or BRCA2 or MSH2, but it will give a better, a more targeted guide as to what the risk of the cancer is and when it is. So it, it sounds like things could change quite significantly over the next few years. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And everyone here today has talked about their relationship with the with the genetics team and the communication and how that's positive that has been. And I just wondered with these changes, I wanted to come to you, Amy, listening to Gareth and thinking about the future and how diagnosis might change in terms of how it's communicated or where it's given or where it's taken. How does that make you feel about the future? 
I'm very positive, actually. I think it's really interesting to hear how it's how it's developing. It's con- also genetics is is constantly developing, and so for myself, I'm looking to have children in the next um, few years, and so it's quite a reassuring thing as well. Like for because obviously when you ha- when you want to have children, like with many of us, it's fifty fifty chance that they would get the the, the gene, the faulty gene, and um, so yeah, it's just it's really interesting and helpful to to hear all about the future of the testing. So I'm going to check time. Um, I think um, it's been such a great conversation, and we could continue. I know we've got some questions, but I know that Mary Angels had um, something that she wanted to ask everyone. Well, I yeah, we are a bit against the time as always, but for each of you, really starting with you, Gareth, and, and each of you, having been in this conversation and listening to each other, uh, I don't know whether there is any any little thing that had made you think about uh, anything in a, in a different way. I don't know, has it been anything that made you think about things in a different way just because you've been here today? Gareth, first? Well, it's, it's always really good to hear feedback from uh from people who've been through the service and 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 luckily it's all been positive it you know occasionally it it, it isn't positive mm. but uh it's it's really nice to hear that positive feedback about how um people have been through the service and feel they benefited from it so that's really important to us to to mm. hear to hear that sort of positive feedback and uh um, you know, uh, you talked about the COVID earlier. Um, mm. It, you know, that has been an issue because breast screening was shut down completely mm. for three months mm. uh, at the start. Colonoscopy was stopped. Mm-hmm. So actually, the department, along with uh, with other departments, were sending out fit tests. These are the testing of the motions in instead of doing a colonoscopy to sort of cover mm. things. So they're not as sensitive. At picking it up, but they are much better than not doing a screen at all. Mm. And fit testing is going to be introduced as the new population mm. bowel cancer testing in uh, in the near future. So it, it, it that that was something. But for instance, for for BRCA one and BRCA two, uh, women who had BRCA1 and 2 were prioritized above all of the other breast screening. So as soon as screening came back on, we were able to say, look, these are the people most at risk. They need to be prioritized for their MRI scans and mammograms. And that happened immediately. So that the back, you know, there there wasn't a big backlog. People were immediately Mm. caught up with uh, uh, on that front. So uh, uh, and, you know, the conditions I I deal with, uh, uh, we haven't had a problem getting MRI scans um, for screening um, during during the pandemic. So it, it's not been a problem. So that's good. Mm, Thank you. I really, it's nice to hear that uh, you're explaining a little bit how things are because of COVID, but also how you are adapting uh, yes. and even taking this, uh, this further. Even if COVID changes, you might introduce this new way of doing things, uh, mm. adding. Thank you very much. Um, Amy, Freddie, Ferns, Shaquille, is any anything that makes you think in a bit different? Son, because you've been here today, listening to each other. How just listening to stories of people can be very powerful. So I'm just wondering whether is it one thing that you want to share with us? You don't need to, but I think I've noticed that um, even though we've all got different experiences and different gene faults, that we've kind of had similar feelings and similar mm. experiences in some of that. Um, just into I think in terms of like knowledge being very powerful and giving us kind of control and clarity in our lives which is something that we've we all share even though we've got quite different experiences and I think it's really positive for me with young children to hear who I didn't have the um the IVF option I just had my children naturally so it's reassuring to hear from Gareth that there are all these sort of developments so that hopefully when they're adults and in the situation that I was in, that they'll hopefully have some sort of slightly less invasive options should they also have for gene fault. So that's been really positive for me to hear some of that. Thank you. 
The one, the one thing I, I would say, and and that's you know again from the feedback you've heard how involved the genetics department is in organising the screening, in coordinating everything. That isn't necessarily typical of genetics departments around the UK or even in Europe. That that many genetics departments are actually one-stop shops. You get your gene test, your diagnosis. And then you're shoveled off to someone else to sort out your screening. And uh, we are fairly unusual. We're, we're the only genetics department that still has active genetic registers for inherited conditions. All of the conditions are the subject of genetic registers where we, you know, we write from time to time. And it allows us to you know, make sure that we're in regular contact and that screening is going on. Um, and so um, you may not find that, I, I'm not, obviously people from outside Manchester may be uh, listening into this at the moment, that it, it, it may not reflect uh, the practice of genetics departments uh, around the UK or even Europe, that, that, that some are pretty proactive, but the majority are more of a one-stop shop. You get your diagnosis, you get your gene test, and then you go off and you're dealt with somewhere else. So, so it's really interesting, Gareth, to hear you that, uh, saying that because for, there are four people here with four different stories and they're all connected to the genetic department, but also um, thanks to that approach, members of the family had been, Amy was saying, even my dad has, doesn't have the gene, is, is, is from, or from this family. And that seems to be very powerful, especially from a mental health position, that you feel less alone and, and this is integrated. So I, I just need to say that because I think it's um, something that may, maybe other people, other departments, other places can learn from, from this feedback. So. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Nick, yes, we are against time. I just wonder if I ask you that, maybe would that be okay? Have you heard something that was taking you somewhere special? Yeah. Well, I'm going to steal Amy and Freddie and I'm going to steal everyone's thoughts and say that what I heard from everyone was that you become really knowledgeable about your own body. And although Gareth was saying that, you know, um, you're unique maybe in the Northwest in terms of, the way that we access genetic services, I think that it's still also about knowing your own body and possibly your own mental health as well, mm. and, and having a little bit of control of that and going to the, going with those instincts and being aware of, you know, kind of who you need to see and what you need to talk about. And brilliantly, when you go and see the people, there is that support. But I think I'm quite empowered by the fact that everyone here has kind of took control of their own. Um, feelings and and not just physical feelings but mental health feelings as well and on to the direction that they need support yeah I, I, I we have some questions from the um, from the public that I can go but I don't want to leave Freddie or Shaquille if you want to add something here or uh, because no, I, like I said, I totally agree with what everybody's been saying. Okay. It's been um, the the genetics department has helped me immensely. You know, I've worked with my kids. I had I had my kids before I even knew I had a problem, um, but they've been like working with me, working with the kids. Uh, they're awesome with the kids. Uh, they sat them down. They talk to them like you know. They explain everything to them. You know, my daughter's just had her blood test done like maybe last month. Mm -hmm. um, and during this COVID time, they actually had a Zoom call with her. So they had a face-to-face -face, uh, consultation with her. When with that uh, reassurance, rather than just over the phone, um, you know, she's understood it. She's uh, a little bit more uh, relaxed. And when she went to get her blood done and everything like that, uh, considering that she's scared of needles and stuff, they were absolutely brilliant in Manchester, you know, with all, with all of my kids. Um, so I can't say anything about them, you know, they've been awesome. Thank you very much. Freddie, you, do you want to add something here? I don't really have anything to add. I, I agree with everything that's been said. And, you know, it was really like inspiring to hear everyone else, you know, everyone's journeys. Um, and also to hear from, from Gareth. Um, you know, people have mentioned that the kind of IVF option, which has, you know, been spoken with us, but not really thought about. And, you know, it's quite interesting to hear that a lot of people don't, you know, with Lynch syndrome, choose not to go down that route. Um, but, yeah. 
It must be quite interesting. It's just still to there. <laughs> it's still there as an option. It's you know, it's uh, it's been approved. But it, it must be quite interesting in terms of that we, we have quite a youthful um, panel today, which um, which has been really nice to hear. But it must be quite interesting. Be accepted, of course. Well, I wasn't going to say that, guy. I was, I was being really polite, and I was. I think you're still very youthful. Um, but I was in terms of thinking. Of, you're almost thinking about the future quicker than you usually would. You know, in terms of like Gareth's talking about IVF options and um, futures of children, and it's it it seems like it accelerates those kind of thoughts or those kind of that planning. It comes a little bit earlier than it might do if you didn't have um, a rare inherited cancer. Would that does that is that kind of correct, Amy? Is that something that? Happens? Yeah, that's right. I think um, when you first find out that you've got that, you automatically think about about what would happen if you had the children. And that's one of the questions that you ask when you first um, get told about the, the inherited disease. Um, but I'm, well, I'm 35 now, so I'm in a position now where I want to have um, children. And so it's something that I'm thinking a lot more about. Um, but when I first mentioned this to my geneticist, um, she said that I can phone up any time to, to book an appointment and to talk about the options again um, with my, my partner. And yeah, it's just, that, yeah, it's very reassuring that we can talk about it any time, about anything that we need to talk about. Yeah. So, do we have, I've got to be a bit technical here, and I have to look at my phone at the same time as I'm looking at you guys in terms of questions, but Marianne, does I think, do we have any questions? Yes, we have some questions that I will need to read, just to make sure I don't... Um any mistakes. Um, so one question is, how is patient expectation managed when genomics results don't always reveal any known genetic association with their rare condition? For you, Gareth, I suppose. Well, I guess uh, it's, it, it's quite it's not necessarily as straightforward a, a question as, as you think. So mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what this so so in the conditions like von Hippel and uh, polyposis, mm -hmm. we nearly always find the genetic fault. So the sensitive sensitivity of the genetic test is getting up towards ninety five percent now with the sort of uh, testing we do. Sometimes when you're the first affected person in the family, the genetic fault isn't isn't identifiable. Uh, in blood because of something called mosaicism. Mm. So the gene fault isn't inherited in the, the egg or sperm that made that person, but occurs later on as you develop an, as an embryo and may not be identifiable in blood. So that's something that we need to explain in some conditions like my, my condition, I've already mentioned NF2. It's about half of all new mutations, half of all people who are the first in their family are mosaics. That's much less common in VHL uh, and APC, but it's an under-recognized uh, thing in APC, actually, that the first person can be mosaic, and that means the risks of passing it on are substantially less than 50-50 if you don't carry it in all, all your cells. Um, so that's the sort of the first aspect of it the other is well i've got this very strong family history of breast cancer but you haven't found anything mm. and, and that's because actually the majority of families where there's quite a strong family history of breast cancer we don't find a genetic mm. fault and we don't know whether that's because it's due to another gene because we missed a genetic fault uh, in one of the existing genes. Again, we think the testing sensitivity is probably 90 to 95 percent. Uh, so there's a small chance we've missed it or that there are more genes to be identified. So we have to get over that complexity that the negative test uh, does make it a bit more likely that what's going on in your family is bad luck or it's down to uh, more common genetic predisposition, what we call polygenic inheritance. Mm. The polygenic risk scores I mentioned earlier might be, uh, you know, able to dig into that in the future um, or that it's something missed in one of the genes that we already know about that we know we don't find every, every single genetic fault. So 
I guess it's trying to get that over because, you know, it's difficult to tell someone who's got breast cancer at 40 in their early 40s, their sister's got breast cancer in their 30s, their mother's had breast cancer at 50, granny's had breast cancer. And in, in that situation, you know, it's difficult to say, look, it's not inherited. Yeah. It probably does have inherited components, but we just haven't found the precise cause of it by finding a mutation, uh, a gene fault in BRCA1 or BRCA2 or one of the other genes. And, uh, and that's the, the other element of it, that there are now, in fact, more than 12 genes that at least double the chance of you getting breast cancer in your lifetime. And the NHS only tests three of them, mm-hmm. BRCA1, BRCA2 and PALB2. Uh, although we're we're trying to now get that expanded back up to include uh, some of the more common genes, uh, ATM and CHECK2 are what we call moderate risk genes. So we're trying to get it expanded up so less people are, end up with that, uh, you know, well, there might be another gene out there, but we haven't tested for it mm-hmm. sort of answer. Thank you, Gareth. I have another question, but you might have to just help me with pronunciation. Um, And I think this is probably, this is a mixed question. It probably can go to um, Fern and and Amy and Freddie and Shaquille in terms of sharing stories. So um, I'm going to read it out. My mother had lymosarcoma. Lymosarcoma, yeah. Thank you, Gareth. Um, When I was born, in fact, the tumour was so big, I was born with a dent in my head and a birthmark on my face. Um, I was hanging out with this in the room for nine months. And she wants to know, what's the best way to share success stories? So she is 44. um, And back in 1976, it was super rare to survive. Um, And she wants to kind of think of a way of how to give hope to others. Um, She now works for the NHS and is a lived experienced ambassador. But I know we've all kind of, you guys have shared your stories today. And in terms of I guess, Fern, how positive and effective is it for you when you share your story? What, what's the impact that that has and how can we do more of that? I think I think it's like, I think this, this is across all walks of life for, for lots of things that we do that you're always going to hear the negative stories, be it this sort of scenarios that we're talking about or other things. And I think just trying to share your positivity and keep your kind of hope around your story is you know I, like it will be very easy for me to talk about my story negatively but I'd choose and deal with it in a way that I don't think that that's a helpful thing for me to do and that's not to say that it's not okay to feel negative about it I think you know you we all have those good and bad days but I think when you're trying if you're trying to create a hopeful and positive story is just doing exactly that is sharing that story positively and not kind of allowing the the negative sort of aspects of things or what people might say to your expectations that people might have to impact how you're feeling about your story and how you decide to share it and I think that's that's sort of how I sort of look at it and you know I've come across people you know close to me and not close to me that look at it differently to me but you know I can only choose to kind of think about it in the way I I do and that's how I kind of deal with it and cope with it so that that would sort of be my advice really. How do you think um, kind of external narrative, so in terms of like the media and obviously Gareth mentioned Angelina Jolie was one of the most prominent people and I think Michelle Heaton, so she was in the media recently. How does that impact kind of how you tell your stories or how you hear other people's stories? What impact does the media have? Is it so, Sometimes it helps people to go, oh, I know what you're talking about because I've heard Angelina Jolie's got it or I've heard Michelle Heaton had it. Um, so I think sometimes it helps, but I think also sometimes it, information can be misrepresented and misunderstood um, and glamorised a little bit. Um, so one of the things that I've had, which I understand why people say it, but I also I always sort of take a bit of an in sharp take a breath is people saying, oh, well, you've got a boob job and a tummy tuck on the on the NHS. And it's like, you know, <laughs> that that might be how some people look at it and they're wanting to be positive for me and I totally understand that and I don't think anyone says it to me to be hurtful but it's so so much more than that the gym I've had to kind of go through is significantly bigger than that but you know I think it's just about managing your expectations that you know I've lived 
sort of, you know, with this knowledge and develop my knowledge over sort of 10, 10 years and, you know, someone's kind of read a news article or heard something on the media, they're not going to have that same level of understanding um, and just managing your expectations of that really and not expecting people to have the same amount of impact that it has, has on you because as well, when you've experienced it and it's happening to you, you feel differently about it, you know, mm. those things until you know and you've been through it, you're not really going to know what it feels like. So it's just managing your expectations and not taking it in a way you think it's being personal to you because you kind of be helpful, but have maybe just said it in this in the wrong way. I think it's really nice to hear you co commenting and the other stories or or the impact of media and you because when you were saying about positive and negative, I I don't know I am a, I'm a clinical psychologist and when I work with people sometimes is it the scary to talk about the complexity? It's not about positive or negative and and when you all of you were talking today. It is about the complexity of our stories because you cannot, you know, is it positive to have this, have had this in your life? I don't know. It's negative. It, I don't know. But the fact that people share those the stories and it helps others to kind of be more inspired. And I think definitely, I think in my situation, the more that people are aware that this can be something that you can inherit, the better because people need to know that this is a possibility to go to the GP and go, actually, I'm not right now, but there's all this family history. So it's absolutely crucial that the media sort of share those stories. Mm. But I, I, what I would also say is if you are going through the process or having a test or going through the consultations, it's making sure that you're ready to watch or read that bit of information. It might mm. be later on. Um, you know to get to kind of get someone else's experience I'd say make sure that you're secure in your own sort of experience of it and how you feel about it because it can be quite triggering to watch other people's stories in in when it's kind of presented in the media it can sort of be a little bit triggering. So I think we are towards the end of our bit of a conversation and, and our questions, Nick. Um... Yes, thank you so much to everyone. Um, we really appreciated this conversation, especially on a Sunday, on a Sunday that you gave your time up um, on Rare Disease Day. So it's really appropriate to have this conversation on a day like today. And, we, and thanks to everyone that's joined us and for taking the time to share your stories and for Gareth, who has been brilliant at fielding the questions from our lovely audience that are listening and that are very um, interested in, in being here and, and having their questions answered. So thank you so much for joining us and um, we really appreciate it. It's not fully the end. It's not, nope. no, we, we have a treat for the end, but before <laughs> the treat, I, I would like to ask the audience the same question I ask everybody here. And uh, I'm just wondering, because we would like to know for, for people who've been listening, how, and in, in has been part of this conversation today. Um, how has it made you think about anything in a different way? And if you can say that, we'd like to collect these ideas because we want to continue the conversation through podcast or in our website. So the question is, has it made you think anything a bit different um, or in a different way? Uh, just because you've been here today listening to Gareth and Freddie and Fern and Shaquille and Amy. This podcast has been made possible by our brilliant team. Rona McLeod. Ramona Moldogan. Jay Roach. Marianne Jos Ferrin. Nick Lagarde. Fiona Ulf. Nick Jordan. <laughs>